Amen. Would you take your Bible there? Meet me in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians and chapter 6. Today I want to talk to you about spiritual warfare. It's not a topic that we talk about a lot. There's a reason for that. The Bible puts spiritual warfare in its rightful place. It is very real. And yet, when you read the Bible, you don't find spiritual warfare on every page. But this is something that needs to be in our minds because we are in it. We are in it. Whether we're mindful or not, we're in it. I don't preach spiritual warfare every day of the week. I don't often write about it. And here's why. Because I don't want you to live your life in fear of a demon behind every bush. That everything that happens around you scares you to death. That makes you practically uh, immovable. That you're so petrified that everywhere you turn there's a demon trying to fake you out. I don't want you to be in that miserable kind of mindset. Nor do I ever want you to be in the mindset that I only believe in what is real. Things that I can see. This is mistaken logic. That we ever believe only in things that we can see uh, is just an untrue way with an untrue view of life. Hmm? I walked into a playground one time. It was, it was late evening. Darkness was coming. There were four boys around a merry-go-round. There was one large boy, three small ones. I walked up to them as darkness was falling and said, I'd like to share with you how you can go to heaven whenever you die. May I? No one said anything, so I began. When I shared the gospel to them of the good news of Jesus, I asked them, will you now believe in Jesus Christ to save you? I pointed at the big boy first. He said this, I only believe in things that I can see. And he looked so wise when he said it. And I said to him, have you ever seen your brain? The other three boys giggled. And his cover was blown. He was revealed as what? Not being very wise. Because obviously if you only believe in things you've seen and you've never seen your brain, your brain is not what? It's not real. You don't have a brain. The other three boys gladly trusted Christ as their Savior. I hope he did too, but he pretty much boxed himself up and painted himself into a corner that left him without much way to save face on that evening. Never do that. There is a powerful spiritual army around us. Just the fact that we can't see them doesn't mean that they're not real. In fact, we've done a lot through religion and the lies of it to believe in these ridiculous figures in our mind. When, when I say devil, what do you imagine in your mind? Do you see a, a red cartoonish figure from a potted meat can when you were a child and the devil's carrying a pitchfork, has a, has a pair of red pajamas or something like that on? Is that a, an honest picture of the devil? If you believe the potted meat can, it is. Who put the devil in red pajamas? Who made him look so calm? I mean, he looks like a pretty fun guy, right? At least to play a game with. He'd probably double-cross you. And I have a question. What, what is the devil doing with the pitchfork? What, is he a farmer? <laughs> He's been shoveling hay. Is he sticking demons in the bottom with that pitchfork? Is that what he does for fun? Where did we get this ridiculous picture of a devil that looks so comical? So there are a lot of things that we have to overcome whenever we come to this position that we want to understand what's true about spiritual warfare that we're in. Now let me tell you one quick story and put you in the mood for this. This summer we were out at Grace Farm and the water balloons had given out. You ever been in that position when the water balloons give out? I mean it's so good to crack one on somebody, right? But when you reach in that when you reach in that cooler and there are no water balloons, sometimes the mind begins to wonder about, well, what can I do now? Well, I, as a director sword, I was already five jumps down the road past this, okay? The balloons are, are done. It was great fun. Everybody's happy. And I was five steps on the schedule beyond where we were. I had walked by that cooler. It was about half full. Water weighs a little over eight pounds a gallon. 
And I had already thought, I ought to dump that water cooler right now. It's got to, I don't need to do that because there's a little spigot on the bottom. I can open the spigot, it'll drain itself. About 20 seconds later, I walked again by that cooler and it was moving. It was being raised up. And I never imagined that the goal of that water cooler was to empty its contents onto me, the beloved director here. And I wondered, why are they dumping that cooler? All they have to do is open the spigot and it'll drain itself. And don't they know I'm here? The cooler's now up above my head. It just levitated off. And I wonder, don't, don't they know that I'm here? Because I actually believed I have no enemies here. Whenever you believe at any point in life, I have no enemies here, you are on dangerous ground if you have some enemies around. Now, I know the truth here. This is all in fun. These two people loved me, I think. And they would have done me no harm. You couldn't have paid them money. I don't, I don't think you could have given them any money that would leave me crumpled on the ground in a bloody mess. But that's what happened next. When you don't think you have an enemy, you have opened a door wide. I guess that cooler must have weighed about 60 pounds. And when that door flew open and hit me right above the eye, it scarred me for life. These are things that would pale into insignificant nothingness if you could look behind the scenes at the goals of a battle being fought over your life. This is, I know, in your mind to move you from something that's kind of funny. I laugh at it now into a picture that's pretty, pretty graphic. But there is an enemy who would love to destroy your life. And he's an enemy that can't even be seen who has multiplied himself into so many other enemies that would boggle your mind, I think, to know what you and I are really up against in life. Look with me, Ephesians chapter 6. Let's set a little historical context here. Paul the Apostle's written this great letter to the church at Ephesus. He's filled this letter with great teaching that is everything from a review of the gospel to the equipping that God does in these possessional positions that every believer has. He's described for us in chapter 3 the church and how we are a part of God's church. How this church, chapter 2, this church is made of believing Jews and believing Gentiles who are all together. Chapter 5, he gives this great command that we're to be followers of God, mimickers of God as the dear children of God. In chapter 4... He calls himself the prisoner of the Lord and calls us all to walk worthy of the vocation to which we've been called. And he begins in chapter 5 to talk about spiritual life, the life that is spirit-filled. He goes through the family and each member of the family. Finishes up in chapter 6 talking to us about if, you, if you're state in life right now is the life of a child and he gives instruction for what spirit-filled children look like. Is that good? He says... Um, words here uh, if you are a servant in life the way that you are to be a servant for the Lord and as he now uh, gets to the midpoint of chapter 6 Paul the Apostle realizes that his letter is headed toward the finish line and he begins to give us what I call uh, finally my brethren kinds of statements and he's going to insert here in this passage these great words about the spiritual warfare that we're in. That unless he fills us in, we, we can never see this with our human eyeballs. So under inspiration of God, Paul the Apostle fills in the blanks for us to tell us there is something that you can't see. But you better know about it and you ought to believe in the things that God has given you to survive 
a spiritual onslaught by a mighty enemy that is invisible to your brain. Hmm? Is it good? So here we go. Verse number 10, he says, finally, my brethren. So you see then why I began this message with the presentation of the good news of the gospel. How that you can believe in Christ and have eternal life. Because none of what is to come is for you if you're not a believer in Christ. See, if you're not a believer in Christ, you don't have the righteousness of God. You're not in the family of God. You don't possess eternal life. The positional blessings that are presented to you in this very letter Paul wrote for believers are not your possessions. You're not a child of God. You're not an adopted son. You're not accepted in the beloved. You don't have the seal of the Holy Spirit. It's only you and all that you could scrape up out of the meager resources that you have as an unbelieving creation of God cut loose now in a world that's fallen, broken, and busted because the enemy already holds the cards. So that's why I began by begging you to put your faith in Jesus Christ that you can have the equipment that you would need to stand in this battle, this warfare over your soul. I don't mean your eternal soul. I mean your soul in this life, your very life is at what's at stake. So he says... Finally, my brethren, this is family talk, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So take note of this, that whenever you think of or hear a message about spiritual warfare, the biblical position is not that we should go to our corner and whimper. The biblical position is that we view ourselves as who we are in Christ and that we possess the things that God has given us as believers. Is that good? It's not the idea that we run and hide, that we don't live life trying to hide under the bushes, trying to make ourselves invisible, trying to do nothing so that we don't get any attention from some of those dark powers. It's not that at all. It's a picture of a soldier. Hmm? So the idea that we get is not that we're afraid of spiritual warfare, but we greatly respect the army that marches against us. But we don't greatly respect it to fear and quiver over it, but we rush to the equipment house that God has provided for us that we can dress ourselves properly as soldiers for Jesus Christ. So he says, verse 11... Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All right, let's break this down a little bit. So he says, put on, put on the whole armor of God. So there's armor available, but did you know this is a command? It's a command. In other words, it's possible that that you'll be in this war... And you won't be armored up for it. That'll be your choice. Now, it could be a choice of ignorance. Because there could be a storehouse of blessing that you don't know about, that no one's ever told you about. You've never been taught that there is a storehouse of treasure for you. And out of sheer ignorance, you never go into the storehouse and take any of that treasure for yourself. Wouldn't that be a shame? I knew a man... I knocked on his door, went to witness to him. I was in the great state of Florida. And except the University of Florida is not so great. But as I talked to this man, uh, the man was absolutely broken. Because he'd gotten a letter in the mail from a company that sends out letters at a particular time of the year to get ready for a big sweepstakes drawing. And that letter told him he had won. Now, if you go down into the lawyer small print, you can figure it out that you haven't won a thing, Buster. But they would write those letters in such a way that you just know that you must have a million dollars. You're just waiting on the delivery truck. And he found out because the date went by and he didn't get the truck in his yard. And he was so crushed. That's a false hope. This is not false. God has an armory. God has the armor that you need as a believer in Jesus so that the devil doesn't build a nest in your hair. 
But the command here is that we put on the complete armor. What he means is take every piece of it. Take every piece of it. This is not one piece. This is not whole in the sense that there's one thing and I get that and put it on. No, it's the complete armor. It's all the pieces of the armor that God's given to me. That's what I'm supposed to know about because I have it in the Bible, right? And not only do I know there's a place I can get this armor, but I need to go into that place. I need to put on that armor. I need to equip myself with the armor I've been given. When I was in college, I did a Bible study with a couple of college girls. And uh, one of them told me one day, she was a commuter. She commuted to the college. And she told me, Boy, the devil was all over me this morning. She said everything was going wrong. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of the house. And it was getting to the time I knew I've got to leave her. I'm going to be late for my first class. And she said, Freddie, I just stopped. She said, I just stopped. And I said, devil, you're messing with me. And I know you are. You're trying to wreck me today. And if you don't stop right now. I'm going to go put on each piece of the whole armor of God. And I'm going to take my time and I'll blow off all my classes today. But you better quit right now or I'm going to the armor. Now I don't advise anyone to ever talk to the devil. I think we're better off just not even talking to him. I had a guy one time we were praying together. He's praying to God and in the middle of his prayer he started talking to the devil. I don't think that's wise. Never hang up on God to answer a call from the devil or make one, huh? But I love the reasoning that she had. All right, I know you're there. I can't see you, but I know what you're doing. And I have an answer for you. And I've never forgotten that. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of of the devil. Wiles uh, is a Greek word, methodia. Methodia, we borrow that Greek word, don't we, to get the English word method. So the devil says here, the devil has methods against you. I mean, this is not flippant stuff. Methods signifies someone's been thinking about you. Someone has put together a plan. Someone has a methodology to attack you. And there, most people are, it seems to me, not really given a whole lot of thought about any spiritual powers that are coming against them in life. I'm telling you today, better give a thought. Now, I've, I've told you, I'm trying to be balanced here. I want to balance this. I don't want you whimpering in a corner, afraid to move. Nor do I want you imagining in your life that there's a demon behind every bush, around every corner, that just petrifies you from it. No, no, but you better, we better give a thought, amen? We better give a thought because there is somebody out there who has methodology to try and attack us in some way. And he's a guy who knows more about you than you know about him. And he's a guy that you can't even see him. Look, if you can't even see me and I'm your enemy, I'm going to steal you cookies. You don't even know where they went. I'm going to be like Randall in Monsters, Inc. But with his armor of God, he says here that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's a great statement of truth. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, although most of us think we do. If I were to ask you, who who are your enemies? You'd probably name for people, Freddie, you tricked me. Well, I know, I kind of did. But is it true? Don't we often think that the problems we have with people are people? It says here that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But there is a bigger enemy, there's a stronger enemy, there's an invisible enemy we can't even see who maybe has used some methods on some people to come against us. But if we fight against people, we'll be fighting against the wrong enemy. Am I saying anything that's true here? So often in churches, the fight is against one person against another person. Actually, in the Bible, it's not against one person against another person. It ought to be against two people against an invisible devil. Anybody want to say amen today? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 
I know people can be pretty mindless. People can be pretty heartless. We understand this. However, there's a devil in the background of the scene who's manipulating the puppet sometimes. And if you go swinging at the puppet, you're only shadow boxing and the real enemy is out of the picture. So we don't wrestle against people, against flesh and blood, but against principalities. I want you to underline four things in verse 12. Here we go. Principalities... Powers, rulers, wickedness. Did you get all four of them? Here they are. Four levels of this army, this invisible army that has a methodology against you. I'll say them again principalities, powers, rulers, wickedness. Four levels of that army. Now, any army is organized, a house divided against itself will fall. But the devil apparently caught a clue from God. You know that God has arranged his angels in hierarchies of power? Well, the devil has hierarchies of power too. This word principalities means someone is a principal over other people. There is a principal among others. It's hierarchy. Someone bosses others. That's what this principalities is all about. Against powers... This is strength. This is might. He says, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So there are rulers. Here again, it speaks of a hierarchy of power. There are some who rule in this army over others who are less than they are. It's a scary thought. But note here, they're rulers of the darkness of what? This world. Now, this world, the word world, this word world is a great big, look, it's a Greek word about that long that I'm not going to give you, but it starts with cosmos, all right? And we know cosmos means world, yeah. So these rulers of the darkness are in this cosmos here. Well, <laughs> so are we. In the very world that we live in, this fallen, broken, busted world that's been crushed by sin, that we still live under the curse of it, these hierarchies of dark powers are in this world and some of them are bossing the others in the methods that they've established in which to attack you. But then get this, the last one. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. So not only are they in this world, but there's a string of them that goes from this world right into the spiritual realm, which is unseen. This is in the high places. We don't understand all that we think we know about any of this. But you remember the devil always wanted to exalt himself. You remember uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, these great chapters that expose for us where the devil came from. He was a created angel. He was Lucifer. He was star of the morning. And there came a time he exalted himself. He said, I will exalt myself. Five times in Isaiah 14, he uses this word, I will exalt myself. I will. I, I'm going up. I'm going up, 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 up. God said, you're going down. But in the meantime, there is limited power still available to him as well as the horde of angels that fell with him who now are all a part of these four levels of spiritual wickedness that's coming against us. And so often we pack our lunch to live a day in a world never giving thought to the methods that are against us. We better give a thought. We better give a thought and we better go for the army, uh, for the armor. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you. In verse 11 he said put on. In verse 13 he says take unto you. Does it sound like you need to take action? Do you need to make a move? Yes, yes. I, I, I don't do nothing here if I do nothing. Nick Saban, the winning coach at the University of Alabama... Tells his coaches, look, if you're not coaching, you're just letting it happen. Apparently, they're not just letting it happen too much over at Alabama. Six national championships comes from coaches who actually get involved. 
Christians win at being Christians because they take under them the whole armor of God. Is that good? You can't be passive here. If we be passive, we just get knocked down. We're never going to stand. Wherefore, take unto you, 13, the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So here's a command. that We put on this armor, that we stand to put the armor on, that with the armor on, we withstand all the attacks that come against us, and when attacks are all over, there we are still standing. Is that good? That's the battle plan here that we have. Stand, put on the armor, withstand with all that armor, whatever comes against Against you, and at the end of the battle, you're still standing. How do we do it? Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. All right, here's the first piece. Remember, we want the complete set. So here's the first piece. He says that we, we somehow girt about with truth. What's this about? Well, let's have a picture here. Next slide, please. In these uh, pre-biblical times and up into the Bible time, especially among the Romans, they would be dressed in what you might call a tunic. You might call it a tunic. Looks a little, a little bit like a skirt, but we won't go there. This is the way they dressed. I'm thankful for blue jeans myself. But now if your tunic is long enough, that's going to get in your way if you get attacked, right? So you would always have a belt. Are you listening to me, boys? You would always have a belt. I'm going to keep on saying, boys, you need a belt, need a belt. Why? Because if your pants are halfway falling off you, you're not going anywhere in a hurry. And when the battle comes, you don't want anything to keep you from some good, quick movement, some good agility, some athletic stances. And so what you would do is you would take the bottom of your tunic and you would pull it up. You would, I'm going to say it in a, in a crude way. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to give you a good picture. You'd pull your skirt up. You pull it up, pull it up, and then you tuck it into your belt so it's now out of the way. And you have girded your loins. Loins is is a word for hip. It's your hip area. And you want to gird, you want to wrap your loins with anything that would get in your way if you need to beat feet. That's what it means to gird the loins. When the Bible talks about girding your loins, it's always talking about your mind. Girding your loins to a soldier means you tuck that tunic up in your belt and get ready to move. But what does it mean to us? Girding the loins of your mind is all about mind. It's all about brain activity. And so he uses the word truth. A soldier has a belt. What, he's, what he wants us to have is an alert mind that focuses on what's true. Here's where the battle is usually lost. You ever heard the old saying, well, I, don't know, I don't know where to believe in my heart or believe in my head. I just love him so much. Here is disaster about to strike. Trust the mind. Trust the mind, not the heart. That's feelings. That's emotional. You can drink a Coke and change the way you feel. Trust the mind. Worship the Lord thy God with all your mind. It's your mind where the truth is found. You cannot trust to find the truth in your emotions. They can never come before truth. Embrace the truth in your mind. And once you settle on truth, let your emotion do anything they want to do. But don't establish the truth by emotion. If so, you just got your tunic all dangling around your legs. It can get in your way. Truth. It's where it all begins in the mind of someone who will survive the attack. Truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. So you can see the breastplate on the picture that I put up. There's a breastplate. It completely covers this midsection of the body. Now, you remember your biology book in school? Pray that was a long time ago. All right, I wasn't going to bring that up, but... 
in that biology, when you got to that section on insects, they showed you that an insect has three sections in the body, right? There's a head, and then there's a middle section, and that's called the thorax. Yeah, I actually had someone say it, who's in the old group, not the young. It's, it's called a thorax. Well, this is a Greek word right here. Breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate, thoraca. Thoraca, there you see it. If he's a bug, you can find his thorax, right? And God has given us a breastplate to guard, to guard our heart and all the vitals that are under that breastplate. Okay, to a believer, what is the breastplate? Righteousness. Righteousness. There's two kinds of righteousness to a believer. There's positional righteousness. That's what's ours because we believed into Jesus. Is that good? And so after believing in Jesus, I have been given the righteousness of God that's in Christ. You can read uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following. You'll see this righteousness that all believers have automatically because we believed into Jesus. But then God is continually telling believers to actually live in righteousness. And that is choose to do the right things that are in God's eyes. And that's how you can stand against the wiles of the devil. You stand in the righteousness that God's given you in Jesus Christ. And because you are righteous, more and more you grow. More and more you grow into that kind of righteousness that we already have in Jesus. Is that good? But you take your mind off the righteousness that you possess in Jesus Christ. You take your mind off God's call to do right things in the world. And you'll start losing this fight. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, here's where I need to maybe correct something that's in your mind. We love the gospel, don't we? And we believe in fishing for men. But I got to tell you the truth here. <clears throat> Even though it would be convenient for me to use verse 15 to tell you, you need to witness in your life. That's not what verse 15 is talking about. I'm not going to use it for an advantage to try and move you towards doing something that I think is a great thing that you ought to do. He's not talking about witnessing. Okay? What's he talking about? Standing against an attack brought on by an unseen enemy who is mighty on the earth and in the heavenlies. The key word here is the word not gospel. It's preparation. The key word is preparation. Let me ask it to you this way. What are your feet shod with in this verse? Preparation. The preparation. Yeah, that's the, that's the main idea. Your feet are shod with something. What? Preparation. The phrase of the gospel is descriptive of preparation. So it's not that we go and witness to everybody. It's that because we've believed the gospel, we have a preparation. The gospel has given us a preparation to stand against the methods of the devil. And it's very interesting that this preparation is all about my feet. It's all about my feet. It's about my feet. I only ever got thrown out one time. Playing college baseball. There was one time that uh, we were playing at Mercer University and they had a lot of mud on the field. What a sorry, what a horrible field they had, Mercer University. And there was a lot of mud and I was so scared that I wouldn't be able to get good traction when I took off that day with mud. That's what this is about. It's about traction. Because when you're fighting, when you've girded up the loins... Well, you've wrapped that tunic up in your belt and you've put on the, the breastplate of righteousness. You need traction. You've, the main thing here we're trying to do is what? Stand. Stand. An enemy wants to knock you down, but the gospel has given you preparation on your feet. On your feet. The whole idea is you don't want to be barefooted. You don't want skin on mud. You need some souls. You need some traction. The Romans even developed, would you believe this? The Romans actually developed a war sandal that had nails on the bottom. They actually, apparently, they invented what we call hobnail boots. 
with a wink to Larry Munson. Hobnail boots. Why? They didn't want their soldiers slipping and sliding in the mud. And it's the gospel that has given us unslippable traction. And not going to be swept away. No matter what happens, not going to be swept away. I got the preparation that has been given to me because I've received the gospel of Christ. Hmm? So that's all about my feet. Never ever forget the the non-slippable traction that we have been given because we believe the gospel. That's what this is about. I want you to witness to people. But verse 15 is about standing because the gospel has given you good traction that will never allow you to slip. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This picture does not do the shield of faith justice, okay? Advance the slide, please. Take a good quick look. That's going away. The reason this doesn't do it justice, this shield, the shield, it's called a thyreon. That's called a thyreon. And it actually means door. It's a door shield. Some some nations called it a tall shield. But that doesn't do it justice. Advance the slide, please. Here's a real picture. This is actually a picture. This is not a painting. This is a picture uh, sealed, I think, in bronze. There are Assyrian soldiers behind a real thyreon. It's a tall shield. In this picture... Uh, the Assyrians had actually developed partners. There would be a shield bearer. His job is not to fight. His job is hold the shield. And buddy, you get a whole row of those soldiers all lined up behind their thyreons. You got yourself a battle wall that you can advance your forces. You see the one guy shooting out from behind that shield held by another guy. You could make an advancing wall of defense against an enemy. Is that good? Is that good? That's why I don't, don't believe those who make and sell um, shields online today. There are many different kinds of shields, but the one mentioned here, the thyreon, is the door shield that will hide the whole body of a soldier. I can remember we were in... We were in fifth grade, and on the playground, we had a big war broke out. And our side was advancing against the other side, and we all had our own imaginary spears, and we had our bows and arrows, and we had war clubs. Anything you could imagine, we had it all. And everybody would say, I just blocked that arrow with my shield. And everybody is using that round arm shield that was a real type. People are using that. And then, buddy, I had an idea. I said, oh, you didn't get me. I got a body shield. And I busted up the game. At that point, everybody imagined they all had body shields and we couldn't do anything to each other. It busted up the whole game. Little did I know there was a real thing. That's the whole body shield. The thyreon. And that's my faith. And Paul says that goes on top of all the other pieces that are in the whole set of the whole armor of God. That piece, take it first. It'll cover your whole body. To a believer, what is that piece? Faith. It's the shield of faith. No matter what happens to you in life. No matter what war club nails you upside the head, no matter what fiery arrow is shot through the air into you, your faith can overcome it all. Is that good? Is that good? It's your faith. This is where the devil wants to take you. Get your mind, penetrate this helmet that you have, penetrate your mind. He wants to get into your heart and do all kinds of emotional stuff to you. But no matter what the arrow that comes, even the flaming kind, that whole body shield could block it all. And that's your faith. Never put your faith down. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So I have a helmet. That's my salvation. That salvation... Guards my mind. And the sword that I've been given by God is the Bible. So if I'm going to plan to overcome that devil, I better keep my war manual close by. And that's the word of God. Amen. 
Do you feel like sometimes you're getting your head boxed in by an unseen enemy? I do. But as Rudyard Kipling wrote to his son, when all about are losing their heads and blaming you, you just keep your head, keep your head, keep your head about yourself. And you allow the complete armor of God to be your guard and allow you to stand. Above all things, you hold that faith. You hold that faith. You hold your reliance on God. In the end of the day, there may be a flurry against you. You just get down behind your faith and it'll quench all the fiery darts to come against you.